Yeah, my name's Dan. I look after product management for Cambridge Intelligence. Uh, we make a product called Keylines, which is a tool for visualizing connected data. And we have the booth and all of that stuff over there. So feel free to come by and, uh, and get a more in-depth demo. But today, I want to talk about this subject of geospatial networks. So networks, graphs, involving some aspect of uh, geographical data. Um, so even in the, in the keynote this morning, the example from the, um, uh, of the band and a little bit of metadata that explained where the band was, there was latitude and longitude. So geospatial data is kind of everywhere. Um, so I want to talk a bit about some of the challenges around it. So before I do talk about visualizing geospatial data as a graph, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what it even means to visualize data as a graph. So I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying graph data visualization because this data could be anything. It could be from, it could be from a graph database, it could be from an RDF store, it could be from SQL Server, it could be from a spreadsheet. Um, but what Keylines is all about and what we do is all about visualizing any data as a graph, um, which uh, is, uh, is all about basically nodes and edges. So let me talk a little bit about what I mean by visualizing graph data, and then we'll talk about the problems you get when you start trying to put this data onto a map. So what is a graph? Bag, a big bag of nodes and edges is really what a graph is. That's probably not the mathematical definition of the thing, but that's what it is. And when you try and visualize a big bag of nodes and edges, um, what you typically get is a bit of a mess because uh, all you've got is the fact that this is a node and it connects to this node. So one of the first challenges you've got to figure out if you want to do a visualization is where to put these nodes on the screen. Um, and uh, we call that a layout. Uh, a layout is basically the positioning of nodes on a screen. And visualization is, is usually about a screen. And my definition of a layout is that a good layout puts nodes in the best possible location on the screen. That's what you've got to do. Um, and that's a very subjective thing, right? What is the best possible location on the screen? It really depends what you're trying to do. This one is kind of good because it tells me that these ones up here are interconnected and have a bit of a cluster going on. And this guy down here is really isolated from uh, oops. really isolated from the rest of the group. <laughs> and we get to see James's emails, so and it's maybe more interesting. Um, so uh, this, is a, this is a good layout because it tells me stuff. It tells me this guy's very central. These guys are very uh, completely isolated and so on. Um, so that's a layout. And one of the first things you have to do is, is, is figure out where to put things. Layouts get more interesting the more data you have. Um, it's very easy to do a bad layout. It's very hard to do a good layout. Uh, this is one of our most recent layouts, an organic layout, which copes very well with big, big data sets. Um, this is a visualization of insurance uh, claims. So typical insurance claim, you have a person, they have a claim. Claim is on a policy. The claim involves a vehicle. The vehicle had these damages and was fixed in this garage. Um, and uh, this is what these things look like, right? So a typical insurance claim, when you make one, looks like one of these little kind of creatures around the edge of the graph. Um, these things in the middle are a bit more unusual because there's too many connections. Maybe there's a fraud ring or something going on there. Um, so a good layout gives you the kind of macro scale information about what's going on. Um, but also, you can zoom in and, and, and look at the detail. So layouts can be beautiful and they can, uh, can be very powerful. The next thing you want to do if you're doing a visualization is think about how to style your data. Um, so styling means things like using color. It's a little washed out on this screen, but some of these nodes are darker than others and we're using color to show importance. I said this guy was central. Well, we're using a graph uh, algorithm to calculate importance, some kind of centrality measure, and we're, we're drawing the nodes bigger the more important they are. It's a simple trick draws the eye to the important people. These people up here are maybe less important because if you took one of them out of the network, it wouldn't really change things. Uh, so we can use visual style. We're doing other things too. We're using a little picture of a person to represent a person. Sounds, sounds silly, but um, uh, this visual modeling of the data is really important. If people want to get immediate insight from a picture, um, they, it's probably a lot easier to spot that these are people than if we represented this with a, a literal depiction of a triple store and said, this node is a person and try to get URIs on the screen and it would just be much, much uglier than simply drawing a person picture. Um, so that's styling. Styling is good. Um, and you could stop there, but for me, one of the most exciting things about visualizing graphs is interaction. So rather than just having a, having a, a dumb picture, 
uh, you have some kind of um, uh, live interactive visualization. So these are uh, little videos, if I can play one of these. So what do I mean by interaction? Zooming in and out, dragging things around, playing with the data, maybe saying expand outwards, click on these things and bring in more data as I, as I explore the graph. Um, and being able to play with the data like that is another really important aspect of visualization, especially when you have very frightening data sets. If someone has no idea what they're looking at and they see a big tangle of nodes and links, uh, they're much more likely to walk away than if they can play and explore. Even little things like putting a little plus next to a node that tells me there's more data I can bring in is really nice. Okay, so that, um, that's interaction and uh, if I show you one more example of the kind of thing you can do. It, it, you, there's no limit to this, right? I think we're only just beginning to touch on the possibilities for interaction. This is a, a cool thing that we can do where you, you can dive downwards. So you can open up one node and see what's inside it and see how the things inside that node are connected to others. Um, this is going beyond a simple nodes and edges diagram. It's a more complicated hierarchy, but um, if that's what do your users expect and want to be able to see, then you can learn a lot from that and, uh, and hide clutter as well. So, you know, you have a very high level view and if I want the detail, I can drill down. Um, so interactions are uh, really nice and powerful. <coughs> so that's just a whistle stop tour of what I mean by graph uh, data visualization. Um, and then this guy comes along and says, okay, that's lovely, but can I put it on a map? Um, and it sounds like a reasonable question. We've got geospatial data, so okay, let's try. But what happens when you, you do this is um, you get a bit of a mess. So this is, this is something that I call the Boston hairball. Um, and the best thing about the Boston hairball is that you can't even see Boston because it's completely hidden behind the hairball. Um, and this is typically what happens when you, when you try and put this data on a map. Um, one of the first problems that you get is those layouts. Remember I said a layout is the best possible place to put nodes? Well, if the nodes belong in a particular place on the map, you have no choice where they are. This node has to be here, this one has to be here. Um, so all of that freedom you had to show the network in a nicely useful way is now gone because we're, we're forced to put things where they belong. Um, so yeah, layouts are a challenge. There's other challenges too. So. Um, uh, you know, usually if I have a room full of people and I say, how many of you have some geographic information in your database, then, you know, everyone puts their hand up. But if you say, how many of you have geo information on every single entity in your database, then everyone puts their hands down because, you know, if this, if this is a graph representing uh, <coughs> stations or in, a, in a city, you might have data that says these are the people who used it or these are the credit cards that they used or any of this kind of information. And only the station has the geographic data. So you have this problem of the information vanishing as soon as you try to put it on a map, or, or where do you show this non-geographic information? Um, and then interaction. Again, how do you do interaction? Um, I showed you people playing with networks, moving nodes around. Well, if, if the node represents Leicester Square, you can't just move Leicester Square over there. It's a real place. So some people will say, well, you can just move Leicester Square because that's exactly what the guy who did this did. He took all these stations and was very free and creative about where exactly he placed them. And this is a fantastic graph visualization. It's exactly what I described. It's a layout. It's putting the nodes in the best possible place. The best possible place is the best possible place for the use case of helping people navigate their way underneath the big city. And it's a really, really good way of doing that. But they've kind of cheated because they've kind of got rid of the map, um, uh, which is definitely one solution to this. Uh, but if you need the map to be there, if you really need people to be able to look at a map and understand where these nodes are, then uh, uh, you don't have that option. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, ways around that. Um, so yeah, the, 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 you come back to the question, why on earth is this a good idea? Why should we try and put this beautiful data? We've put all that effort in to make it look good, and now we're putting it on a map. Um, and there's a lot of different use cases for it. Uh, we work a lot with people in law enforcement and uh, intelligence where you're trying to um, solve pretty serious problems of, uh, of uh, threats and crimes. Uh, there's a lot of insights you get on a map that you wouldn't otherwise get. Um, and it's a very good way of understanding data at a very high level if you can see uh, geographical summaries. So I'm going to show you a few examples of, um, first of all, why it's a good idea to put this kind of thing on a map, and secondly, how you get around some of those, uh, those problems. 
So, um, first step is interactions again, interactions to the rescue. So, although I said interactions, you, you lose some of them. You can't move things around so easily. Um, there's still an awful lot you can exploit if you, um, uh, if you make the most of it. So, in this example, we've got a couple of different things happening. Um, this is key lines, and these are some nodes on a, on a graph, and behind them we have a map, and we're using a mapping engine called Leaflet, which gives you a whole bunch of geospatial tools. Um, things like hovering or clicking on a state and getting the boundary of that state and highlighting the state that's happening in the, the map. But then the graph is now doing a graph calculation. It's saying, okay, I've picked North Carolina, look at this airport, find me its nearest neighbors, and just show me the nearest neighbors of this airport. And by, by clicking around like this, suddenly the hairball becomes less overwhelming. We can click around and, and um, uh, get a sense of where we are and a sense of uh, making that network more manageable. Um, so. Some interactions don't exist, but other interactions um, become incredibly powerful. Uh, so I would certainly um, say interactions are your friend if you're trying to do a good job of making a visualization on a map. That's one example. Um, what about the problem of missing data? So this is a really tricky one. Um, here's, remember that picture I showed you of the insurance claims and all the little kind of creatures? This is one of those creatures. So a typical insurance claim, here's a person. They have an address, they have a phone number, policy, claim, cars, and so on. Um, and most of this data has no geospatial information. Okay, this, this address has it. We know where the person lives. Uh, and maybe in my example, the garage up here, which fixed the damage on the car, has a, a location. But the rest of it doesn't. These people, these, these witnesses, we, we don't have data on where they live. The car moves around. This is a claim. It doesn't have a location at all. Um, so if I try to put this on a map, what would happen is the only things that would appear on the map would be this pin and this, this garage at best. Um, and we've lost the connected aspect to the data, which is why we're all here. This is connected data London, so um, the connections are gone. So what can we do? And one thing that we can do is say, you don't have to use the data that is, this data that is in your underlying database doesn't have to be exactly what you put word for word onto the screen. So we could make a new model. We could say, let's say, let's connect Let's put this address onto this person as if it's just a property of the person. And let's say if any person made a claim, has a policy which had a claim which was fixed at a garage, let's just do a direct link from the person to the garage. So this whole creature just becomes a much simpler creature of person linked to garage. And this link may not exist in your database, but it's a very useful link for the visual model. Um, because what we can then do, uh, if we take those creatures, here's a, here's a few of those creatures from that other slide zoomed in a little bit. and. Uh, and if I play this one, that's what the remodeling looks like. So a large amount of data is suddenly modeled now into a small number of very different creatures which represent just the geographic subset of information in that graph. And then you can put it on a map. Um, so remember, purple things were people and green things were garages. So we can spot a typical pattern now that most people <coughs> tend to get their car fixed in a garage that's near where they live. Um, but this one that I've highlighted in red is a bit more suspicious because people are traveling a long way to get their car fixed in a garage that wasn't really near where they live. And if you're an insurance company, you might be wondering, if this isn't our preferred garage, why is everyone going here? There was a case where a garage was inflating claims and um, you, could, uh, you might spot that. And there's no way you could have spotted that insight if your starting point was uh, your original graph picture, which looked like that, because those lines wouldn't even be there. Um, so that's one trick you can use to, uh, to get your data, missing data onto a graph, is just to remodel it. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit um, about uh, using the right map. So um, it's one thing to put stuff on a map. It's another thing to, to get the right map. And what do I mean by the right map? Um, it really depends on the use case. So here's a law enforcement example. And if you're, if you're from the UK, you're probably familiar with ordnance survey maps, and that's the kind of map you like to see. That's the familiar context and background that I want to see on a map. Um, if you're from the US or North America in law enforcement, you'll be probably familiar with ESRI, which is a uh, um, geospatial information service, and they provide mappings. And having your own familiar map is a really nice thing. You recognize things. So being able to put any maps in the background is important. That's something we... Uh, we let you do it, Keyline. So we, we try not to be opinionated um, about the map because it really depends on, on the use case. And 
again, by exploiting those interactions and letting people uh, play with their, with their visualization, we, we can let them do things such as changing the tiles, um, so showing street views or showing um, satellite imagery behind the data. So here's the connected data, here's the tiles behind it, turning on and off overlays. That kind of freedom to get the map you want is pretty important. Um, if we have a little thing here, I, I click show police stations and what's going on here is we don't have any police stations in our database, but we can go off to a third party um, geocoding service that says, find me the police stations nearby, bring them in and add them to the visual model. Um, these things are not in the original graph, they're in the visual model. Uh, if you're a law enforcement um, analyst and you want to know where the nearest police stations were to these events, then that's a really useful view. So again, you're, you're solving, you're basically exploiting what maps give you um, to help you counter some of these difficulties of uh, trying to show data um, that is inherently not designed to be on a map on a map. Um, so the final example uh, case study is all around um, kind of stretching the idea of a map a little bit, but um, this is a map, but uh, this is a map as a dashboard. So another really, it, it's a really common phrase, right? People say, give me the 30,000 foot view or something. And you know, that's, that's what people want to do. They want to they see the high level before they zoom into the detail. So very often um, your graph or your, your link data represents very complicated, stuff that you want to get a very high level view of. So here, these are representing factories or locations. This is a net IT network topology of some kind. Um, and underlying this are millions of, or thousands or whatever it is of connections. But what you want to know is, is get a very brief picture of what's going on. So I can see I've got a few sites and something strange is going on here. Um, in this case, Maybe some machine in New York is talking to sites on the public internet that it's never talked to before. And maybe there's uh, this kind of um, cyber threat problem where you want to spot unusual activity. Often it's, it's a case of just spotting unusual things. Um, so if I was in an operations room and I wanted to get a high level picture of this network, I don't want to see the detail. I just want to see something like this. And I can see, oh, there's a problem there. Um, but uh, this map here is not really a map, it's just a picture of a map. Often when you're trying to do a big operations room visualization, you, you, you don't want the clutter of you know, country names or all of the detail because there's nothing worse than putting labels on your graph and then having labels on the map and having them clash with each other and um, just too much, too much text. So um, here we're using an image instead of a map. It's a very nice way to, to summarize things. Uh, and the really cool thing, just to... Uh, to finish up, this is, um, this is the new version of Keylines that we're about to release in the next uh, week or so. And you can see, if I can find the play button, what we can do is, if I want to drill down, look inside Bangalore, um, we're now not using a map at all. We're using a floor plan, and we're showing um, zones or, or, or aspects of this network that are not in any way, um, uh, they're not really geocoded but uh, we can treat them as if they're maps. And now you can start to see the benefit of this because um, in terms of giving context to a set of what is pretty dry data, this is basically log files of a machine talking to a machine. If you actually saw the raw data behind this, it would be very uninspiring. It's pages and pages of this IP address, talk to this IP address. Um, uh, and trying to have an end user or an analyst understand that connected data is really all about helping them see it in a familiar context. So whether that's the high level geographic view um, or, uh, or uh, a floor plan, where are these machines physically located, which zones are they in, whether they're virtual or, or real, um, it can be a really powerful tool. So uh, kind of summarize all of that. Basically, my, my, my top tip would be if don't let a requirement for a map ruin a good visualization. You put a lot of effort into your database, you put a lot of effort into um, thinking about getting that knowledge into one place um, and it's very easy to and this doesn't just apply to maps it applies to visualization in general it's really easy to spoil all of that by getting a poor user interface and having users just look at it and go oh that's that's horrible I've, I've talked to a lot of people who are you know use the language there they're scared of the graph because the graph is that tangled overwhelming mess um, the idea sounds great, but when I see that thing, I, give me a spreadsheet because I know spreadsheets, they, I'm familiar with them. Um, so 
obviously we're in the visualization world, so we think this is important, but I, I would argue it is, it is important. Um, and if you're trying to do this on a map, try to show geographical stuff there. These are the tips. So use interactions where you can exploit what mapping gives you, overlays and hovering and so on. Um, choose the right data model. And if, uh, if some of your data is missing, think about how you can represent it um, and pick the right map. Pick something people are familiar with. Pick something that isn't full of clutter of labels if labels aren't relevant. If labels and streets are relevant, then give people the ability to turn them on and off um, and uh, think about how the map adds context um, rather than adding confusion. Um, so that's, that's pretty much all I had. So I'm happy to take questions. We, we have a booth over there. And if you want to see a demo of this in action, then we, we can show it to you. Um, we go a lot further than just maps. We look at any kind of connected network visualization. Um, but our, uh, our new release of the software is all about that geospatial aspect. So that's, uh, that's what I was hoping to get across today. So thanks very much. Happy to take questions. Thank you.